tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about wicked walks and creepy car rides. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself is a lifelong process, especially because we're constantly growing. Just when you think you've figured things out, you're not quite sure what you're after anymore. Sound familiar? Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Meg Keane and Christopher O'Halloran are voice talents Alicia Pavlis and Eric Peabody. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale of the evening is written by Meg Keen and is performed by Alicia Pavlis. In it, we meet a young woman who is walking home from the train station at night after work. Deciding to take a shortcut, this route takes her down to the edge of the woods and through an underpass. Now, without further ado, I present to you the underpass. The sky was black by the time I reached the station. Sudden winter darkness, where the sky abruptly switches off the lights during the commute home. Clasped between my fingertips, my head lay heavy in my hands as the train swayed and screeched as it came to the end of the line. Desperate, I pinched at my inner thigh in an attempt to settle my overwhelming thirst for a drink after a bad day at work. Silver dots danced in my peripheral vision around the automatic doors as I stood. Burst blisters rubbed anew as I stepped onto the platform and headed for the exit. The stark contrast of the darkness outside illuminated the fluorescent light of the station. Few cars passed by, and fewer people walked the streets. The weekday hustle and bustle had truly ended as shops and small cafes fell into silent slumber beneath the safety of their shutters. It took a long time to commute into the city, morning and night, and I wondered when I'd last seen any of them open. 
The lampposts hummed overhead, their flickering light barely visible amongst the deep orange top trees. It didn't matter though. I wouldn't be on the road for long. There was a shortcut, an alleyway, descending into the woodland's very cusp. And while the dry remnants of a stream kept the thick of the wood at bay, the darkness wore heavier down there. The route was simple and busy on summer evenings, but not tonight. Tonight, it was desolate. Through the underpass by the old winter mill, across the junction, and three residential streets until home. Sometimes I wondered how much of a shortcut it really was, but continued all the same. Creature of habit. I moved quickly on the downhill descent before catching myself at the cycle barrier. The footpath was earthy and soft. Rainwater pooled in previously stepped footprints across the mud. The surface slid under my flimsy shoes and I almost lost my footing once more. With a strong drink in mind, I focused my eyes on the crescent moon above the trees and began walking toward the underpass. Purposeful steps with careful avoidance of larger, deeper puddles across the waterlogged path. The cold air bit at my cheeks and burnt the tips of my ears as I pressed on down the walkway. The old water mill was the first landmark on my route. 1881, the plaque read. Once an integral part of town, now reduced to a crumbling structure. The roof puckered to reveal a dark hole where tiles and brickwork had fallen away over time. There it endured suffocating ivy and nesting birds as nature reclaimed the plot in which it sat. The narrow path curved as it approached the underpass, and after one wrong footing, I lost my shoe in thick mud. I heard something when I paused briefly to locate it in the shadows. While I had come to a halt, the sound of sloshing footsteps was somehow continued. I turned ever so slightly to glance over my shoulder down the path I had already trodden and caught sight of something in the darkness. A shadow, darker than the blackness itself, stood tall by the old water mill I had just passed. It hadn't been there moments before, had it? With my sodden shoe in hand, I took another step forward and watched as the shadow followed once more. Please leave me alone. I dug my nails deep into my hands until my palms resembled the crescent moon I'd been following. As I picked up my pace, so did the figure, though it would fall into shadows when I turned to check its proximity. Predatory stalking. I was being hunted. Not tonight. I don't want to do this tonight. With the underpass in sight, I kicked off my other shoe. Water splashed up my trousers, and mud oozed between my toes as I took long, brisk strides. I tugged at my shirt collar as I moved, the nape of my neck slick with sweat. Stay away from me. The junction needed to be narrow to run. Hiding was my only option. When I reached the underpass, I slipped into a crevice where time had eaten away at the brick. Moss blanketed the ground, and tall weeds poked through the cracks, sprouting from the dried up riverbed. Trains were no longer running, so there would be at least no sudden lights to reveal my hiding spot. Curled up on the ground in the fetal position, I squeezed my body against the crumbling brick making myself as small as possible, and forced the sleeve of my drenched shirt over my nose and mouth. Slow, shallow breaths. It will go past, and it would all be over soon. The footsteps grew closer until I could hear the heavy breathing which accompanied them. 
The figure panted into the cold air as its footsteps advanced through the underpass. It knew I was hiding somewhere. I wondered if it decided to walk around the tunnel if it would see my bare feet poking out the other side of the hole. In desperation, I curled my toes tightly and squeezed my body close. The noises quietened as they passed me. But still, I plugged my nostrils and bit my lips into a line to remain silent. Silence did follow. I waited for a painstakingly long time to ensure it had gone. I even considered staying until dawn, but I couldn't risk being found should it return during the small hours. The traffic from the junction up ahead sounded. Late night cars whizzing up and down somehow felt hopeful. Carefully, I crept out of the crevice, with crumbling brick falling from my hair and work clothes. Somehow, the darkness had grown thicker in the time I spent with my eyes pressed shut. Still, the moon pushed through the wavering fog to light the ground outside the underpass, a cooling glow of safety in the moonlight. I breathed out a breath I had been holding for so long, and was finally able to take a deep breath, but... What was that smell? As I stepped into the moonlight, something grabbed my waist and pulled me back into the darkness of the underpass. I clawed at the mud as I was dragged backward and thrown against the brick. It had waited. Eyes adjusting to the darkness, the tall figure emerged. The stench of cigarettes and body odor wafted into the cold air. His disheveled shirt was buttoned up wrong, and the tail end was caught in his zipper. He was swaying, too, but his was from alcohol. Before I could escape, he clumsily grabbed at my face, hooking his finger inside my mouth and catching the inside of my cheek with a jagged fingernail. It tasted of ash and dirt. He squeezed my face until my cheeks nearly touched inside of my mouth. What do you want? I managed through pursed lips. I want you because you came down the wrong road tonight, sweetie, he said, his warm breath stinking of stale beer. It was no use fighting it anymore. While I had tried so hard for weeks, the opportunity had presented itself. And no matter how hard I tried to fight it, I was parched. As his grip wavered, I was able to contort my face, lifting my cheeks with the corners of my lips to reveal a smile. No, I said with pity. You did. The wrist came first as it was closest. The radial artery pinched against enamel like a guitar string as his vocal cords matched the pitch. From afar, it must have sounded like a train screeching into the station, slicing through. The hot liquid spurted and pooled under my tongue. It trickled down my widening throat and ignited a thirst I could no longer control. His skin puckered around the wound as his arm dropped limp to his side. He stared helplessly into my eyes, pleading silently for mercy. But mercy did not come. The metallic aroma filled the cold air as he slid down the rough brick of the underpass. Looming over him, I lurched with sharp incisors to pierce his throat. Blood gurgled in his mouth as he dabbled. Blood gurgled in his mouth as he babbled incoherently. I leaned across, dabbing a tear from his streaming cheeks and cooed him softly, hushing his whispers and kissing his sodden, sticky lips. What? I asked menacingly. Isn't this what you wanted? The path was deserted, so I knew I could take my time, quenching a thirst that had driven me mad for weeks. No matter how hard I tried to ignore it, Despite his size, 
he was easy to lift and drag along the muddy pathway. Strength coursed through my veins after a successful feed, and bodies were much lighter without blood. We reached the old water mill, and I lifted his limp, graying frame up over the roof. There he tumbled down through a mossy opening by the nesting birds, though they didn't stir, and he didn't fall far. Luckily for him, his fall was broken by a pile of other lone men who came down the wrong road. I hope you enjoyed The Underpass, as written by Meg Keane and voiced by Alicia Pavlis. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. If you're a human being, which I'm pretty sure all of you are, there's one you know all too well. Getting to know yourself is a lifelong process. Myself and I, we're like an old married couple. I tolerate myself for the most part. We share meals, watch our programs, etc. But even after all this time, I'll still learn something new about myself once in a while. Brussels sprouts, for instance, not bad at all. And all those years I could have been eating them. I'll never get those years back. Okay, not a very pertinent point, but life is a journey, and the longer it takes to figure yourself out, the longer it takes for you to get anywhere. That's why it's never too early or too late to connect with a licensed professional therapist from BetterHelp Online Therapy. There's nothing better than therapy to help you figure things out. An objective listener knows how your mind works, can help you clear through the clutter and find your life's true path. Here's how it works. Fill out a brief questionnaire on their website to help them to get to know you a little bit. Keep in mind, therapy has numerous applications. Whether you struggle with anxiety, depression, stress, or just need a little guidance, you'll be matched with someone perfect for the job. From then on, you'll have a wingman. You can text your therapist anytime and receive prompt, thoughtful responses. You can schedule weekly video chats or phone calls, whichever you're more comfortable with and any obstacle in your path, your therapist will never be further than arm's length away, right there in your pocket. All this without ever setting foot in an office. It's all done remotely, online or on the phone. Here's why I personally think therapy is great. Most of the time you make decisions, you're acting out of your own ego. That's how we sabotage ourselves. Your ego wants something in the moment and tells you to go after it. Meanwhile, it's never the thing you really need to be doing. Therapy helps you see the big picture and stay on your personal path to success. Oh, and did I mention that it's affordable? Since it's all done online, there's no office or employees to pay for, and those savings get passed down to you. There's a good reason two and a half million people have used better help, folks, that's a whole lot of people discovering their potential. Might as well become one of them. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. With a background in acting, writing, and photography, Alicia Pavlis is no stranger to the entertainment industry. Her work is influenced by science fiction, fantasy, paranormal phenomena, and the human experience. Alicia's ever-growing passion to tell stories can only be measured by the rate at which the universe itself is expanding. Our second tale of the evening comes to us from author Christopher O'Halloran and is performed by Alicia Pavlis and Eric Peabody. From the back seat of her dad's car, seven-year-old Tracy is tormented by a man made of shadow, pursuing their vehicle at highway speeds. 
When a blown tire strands them on the side of the road, it's only a matter of time before the entity reaches them. Now, without further ado, I present to you Speed of Shadow. Dirty slush splashed from either side of the car. Tracy held a flashlight in her hands. A little wind-up thing. For emergencies. Miss Green had told Tracy's second grade class that nothing could travel faster than light. But she silently disagreed in the self-assured way only a seven-year-old can. She held her hand in front of the lens and flicked the light on. The shadows of her fingers climbed the back of Dad's seat as the surrounding light hit them. A forest of digits. Jeez, Trace. Said Dad. You trying to blind me? She dropped the flashlight, its beam lighting up her boots. Sorry. She snatched it up and turned it off. The experiment proved her hypothesis, though. Those shadows were faster than the speed of light, if only by a little bit. Or were they always there? When all was dark, the shadows remained. The light only revealed their hiding spots. She'd have to do more experiments when they got to Mom's place. Tracy stared out the window as the headlights on Dad's old sedan lit up the trees. The beam sent their shadows stretching up through the forest. The woods were dark and weird on either side of a new road her dad took after the radio squawked about a pile up on the freeway. The detour didn't bother Tracy. A scenic route was better than the fast pace of the freeway. The winding roads better than the monotonous stretch where time became infinity. Hibernation was another subject covered by Miss Green. She saw bears that weren't there hiding in the shadows, ready to jump out and snatch anyone who stopped on the side of the road to change a flat tire. She imagined cougars prowling through the woods beside them, bunnies hopping over branches, nibbling on wild lettuce, a quick meal to fuel their hibernation. If bears didn't get enough food before winter, they'd die of cold. Tracy began to fidget as their car bounced up and down on the back road. How much longer? She asked. Dad glanced at her in the rearview mirror. It'll be a while, honey. Just go to sleep. I'll carry you inside when we get to your mom's. Okay. She looked out the window again and closed her eyes. She tried to sleep. But no matter how hard she thought of sheep frolicking over fences, she kept getting bounced awake by the bumpy road. Rubbing her eyes, she poked her older brother in the shoulder. He was in the front seat with earbuds and an iPad in his lap. He ignored her. Rubby. She reached through the gap between his seat and the door to poke him again. Can I have the iPad now? Sighing, he pulled an earbud out. What? Can I have the iPad? Piss off. He jammed the earbud back in. Dad reached over and yanked it back out. Don't talk to your sister like that. Whatever. Robbie put the earbud back in. When he turned 15, it was like he didn't have to listen to them anymore. Probably because he was mad about mom and dad not loving each other. It's okay, daddy, she said. I can wait. I appreciate your patience. He reached over and shook Robbie's shoulder. I'm sure Robbie does too. Tracy turned her attention out the window again, and in the side mirror saw Robbie roll his eyes. Raindrops rolled down the glass. She pretended they were racing, each drop in a mad dash to reach the rubber at the bottom of the window. It wasn't as exciting as Roblox, but Tracy imbued the drops with backstories and characters, letting her imagination run wild. 
she pitted two fat drops against each other. Arch rivals from neighboring countries, as different from each other as black and white. The drops were named after boys at school who sometimes made jokes at her and pulled her hair, and sometimes bought her flowers and shared snacks with her. They started down the window, gravity pulling them down, and the wind pulling them toward the car's trunk. She had her money on the right drop, Michael, but her heart lurched as it paused halfway down, and the left drop, Jace, gained the lead. Tapping the window, she urged Michael on. Come on, she whispered under her breath. Her heart gave another lurch as she noticed the shadow of a man gaining on the car. Tracy craned her body to get another look. He was a black shape, almost blending in with the night. His legs spun like the wheel of a bicycle, just a blur beneath his torso. He was far behind them on the road and falling further back every second. But his speed made her jaw drop. She had never seen a person go that fast. He faded into the darkness, a shadow merging once more with the surrounding black. She straightened forward in her seat. Was that real? Daddy she said. How fast are we going? About a hundred, he said, glancing in the rear view. Why do you ask? Can a person run that fast? He laughed his big belly laugh, a sound that always brought a sense of pride when she was the cause. A smile crept over her face. Her fears banished. Of course not, <laughs> he told her. Usain Bolt couldn't keep up with us. We're practically flying. Tracy didn't know who Usain Bolt was, but she was still smiling as she returned her attention to the window in search of another pairing of raindrops she could imagine racing. As hard as she tried to focus on the water, she couldn't help but keep peering back at the darkness the car left behind at 100 miles per hour. A couple of minutes later, her dad's phone buzzed next to the McDonald's cup in the cup holder. Mom. He told them before accepting the call and putting it on speaker. Hey, Marissa. We'll probably be another 40 minutes. There was an accident on the freeway, so I took a different exit. We'll get back on at the next one. Shouldn't slow us down too much. You better not be holding the phone. The fines have doubled this year. Mom sounded irritated. It was how she usually spoke to Dad. You're on speaker. Hi, kids. Her cheery words were thick, as if coated in fruit syrup. Did you have fun at Nam's? Tracy leaned forward against the seatbelt. Yeah, Mom. She made those marshmallow squares again. Yummy. Where's Robbie? He's watching a movie on the iPad. Dad explained. You shouldn't let him play on that thing all the time. It's all he does. The irritation was back in her voice. Dad drank from his McDonald's cup, his jaw clenching. Few things made him mad, but Mom's lectures were top of his list. Whenever he had the kids alone, she had something to say. Silent and easily overlooked, Tracy often overheard. There isn't a whole lot to do on this drive. He placed the cup back in the holder. It's not a big deal. No longer irritated, Mom was downright angry. Tracy turned her head away as her parents started to fight. I bet you're smoking in there with them too, Mom said. And out of the corner of her eye, Tracy saw her dad fingering the pack he kept in his jacket pocket. He left them there, though. Dad always kept her and Robbie's lungs smoke-free. They went back and forth like that while Tracy turned to the window. Trees flashed by. Big Christmas trees. Too big to fit in anything but a giant's house. Picturing her dad trying to drag one of those gargantuan trees up the stairs to his apartment made her giggle. <laughs> but the laugh caught in her throat when she saw a sudden movement in those trees. 
With an eruption of broken branches, the dark figure burst from the forest and continued his chase. She tracked it and stared open mouth out the back window as it followed their car, its legs pinwheeled with the same rapid movement as before. It was far enough away that Tracy couldn't make out the details of its face, but even her near-blind Nan would have been able to see the maniacal grin stretching from ear to ear. Tracy couldn't be sure, but the man looked to be gaining on the car. They were stuck behind a big semi-truck, going way slower than before. Her seven-year-old mind felt the terror of a weak animal cornered by a predator. The man would catch up to them soon. What would he do when he did? Robbie, she croaked and was surprised at her voice. It felt like small vibrations on a tight wire and came out puffy and weak. Her brother continued watching his movie, unaware she had said anything. In the driver's seat, Dad argued with Mom about something he had let the kids eat. They had once again fallen into their old habit of talking about them as if they weren't even there. Tracy didn't care about their tone. There was a bigger problem, and it was gaining on them. When she turned back around, she saw him. Now only a car's length away. A darkness welled up in her, black and paralyzing. She whimpered, but nobody heard. The man's smile was inhuman, wider than she had ever seen. His lips pulled back, displaying huge teeth as big as her textbooks. He panted like a dog, but wore a look of joy that she had never seen on any animal. His limbs and torso looked like Horses had pulled them and stretched them with so much force that he became long and slim. He reached toward the car, opening and closing his hands like a child desperately grabbing for a candy bar. Spit dribbled from the corners of his mouth and flew off in trailing streams. If she could call it a man, the man had a head round like a basketball black as the rest of his body, just yellow, bloodshot eyes and blindingly white teeth held within a nightmare. He wore no clothes, but had no private parts. He was an absence of light, a speeding shadow in pursuit of her family. Tracy poked Robbie. He brushed her off and continued watching his movie. Dad, she said. I'm on the phone, honey. She usually hated when he brushed her off like that. But now she only felt panic. Look behind. Don't interrupt, Tracy. You know better than that. Mom said from the cup holder, not bothering to switch to her syrup voice. I should let you go anyway. Dad said. We've still got a while to go. Whatever. Just don't let them drink any soda. There's no helping you, but I will not let them balloon up like you did. Thanks, Marissa. Love you, kids. Tracy stared at the man. He met her eyes, jubilant as he held her in his gaze. His breath billowed from between big clenched teeth. He was almost within arm's reach. If she rolled her window down, Tracy would smell his breath. It would smell like the box that she placed in the ground when her gerbil passed away. He was alongside the rear corner panel of Dad's sedan when his arm reached toward Tracy's door handle. She frantically fumbled the lock, confirming the door was secure. He would get in anyway. Closing her eyes and covering her head, Tracy waited for the sound of ripping metal and speeding wind. Instead, she heard her dad's phone beep as he hung up. The car surged ahead. When she opened her eyes... They passed the semi and left the shadow creature in the dust. Henry is taking your mom on a surprise trip to Bellingham, so you kids get to spend the week with your old man. Dad put his turn signal on after the semi truck flashed its lights, indicating that it was safe to get back into the lane. He turned the wheel and gently crossed over the broken line, separating eastbound traffic from westbound. Tracy looked out the back window, and the truck driver saw her pale face. He gave her a casual wave. She turned back around. 
What? In her calm down from her panic, she'd forgotten her manners. Uh, sorry, um, pardon me? Dad wasn't as strict on the pleas and thank yous, but Mom hated it, so she tried to keep in the habit. You're going to be staying with me this week. She brightened up at this and brushed away thoughts of the slender shadow man. At any rate, they were getting further and further away with every mile, and she no longer considered him a threat. Not for them, anyway. She felt bad for the truck driver, who he would undoubtedly target next. Maybe not, though. Maybe he was just after little girls. Tracy knew people were always after little girls. Mom had drilled stranger danger into her head since she could talk. Yay! She clapped her hands together. Dad looked back at her in the rearview mirror and smiled. Good. Robbie said, wrapping up his earbuds. Henry's a dildo. Dad slapped Robbie lightly on the thigh. Don't talk like that. Your mom loves him. You should respect him. He didn't seem to mean what he said. Robbie passed her the iPad from between the two front seats. She thanked him before opening the Candy Crush app. Are we going to go straight to your place? Robbie asked Dad, pulling his phone out. Well, you'll need more clothes, so we're going to your mom's first. Pack a couple of bags and send the two newlyweds off with some good wishes. Ah, uh, Robbie said. Do we have to? Why can't we just wear what we're wearing now? I don't want to smell your butt for the next week. Dad replied. Come on, I can turn my underwear inside out, backward, backward and inside out. That's like four days of use. I can go commando the last couple of days, no problem. Never go commando in jeans, kid. If I only teach you one thing, it should be that. He looked over with a serious expression. You really don't like Henry, do you? It's not just him, said Robbie. It's mom, too, the way she is around him. She looks at him with these stupid eyes, and they have these stupid in-jokes. You try talking to her, and she treats you like a kid. Like anything we say is just cute or whatever. It's annoying. Ah. Dad replied. She hasn't looked at me with those stupid eyes in a long time. Gross. I don't want to hear about it. Robbie cringed, but Tracy could tell he was just pretending. Dad shared a laugh with Robbie. It made Tracy happy. They didn't laugh together all that often. She liked Dad way better than tall, well-built Henry with a good job. Dad felt bad about his belly. It worried Tracy, too. Mom said soda and cigarettes took down greater men than he. Tracy looked forward to him quitting in the coming new year. He would be around for them. He wouldn't let a dildo raise them. At least he doesn't beat you, Dad said. You don't beat me, Robbie replied. I beat you at Madden. Robbie laughed again. <laughs> yeah, right. We'll see about that, old man. I'm packing the Xbox when we get home. Uh, to Mom's, I mean. You're on, bub. He was looking at Robbie and smiling when the bang came. She dropped the iPad. It slid onto the floor as the car began to shake and pull to the left. It stunned Tracy and pulled her out of her game. Shit! Dad exclaimed and pulled off onto the shoulder. Tracy sat in horror. The image of the shadow appearing in her mind. The desire in his eyes. The lust in his grin. Why, why are we stopping, Daddy? She asked him. She turned in her seat and looked out the back again. The road stretched out far behind them. No one was there. Moonlight gleamed off the wet asphalt. Dense trees stood on either side of them, trapping them and making Tracy feel like she was at the bottom of a canyon as rain filled it up. If they stood still, the shadow would reach them. Just a flat tire, hun. We'll have it changed in a jiff. Robbie, give me a hand and grab the spare from the trunk. The guys opened their respective doors and got out, Dad bending to pull the latch that popped the trunk. Sit tight. We'll be rolling real soon. No, no, Daddy, we need to go. Her words were only halfway out when her father closed the door and walked back to the trunk. He pulled a black bag from within and she heard his muffled voice ask Robbie if he could handle the tire. 
Through the glass, she thought she heard Robbie say, piece of cake, but couldn't be sure. Her heart was beating so fast she could hear it, dull in her ear. Her mouth tasted like metal. She double-checked the locks. When the car lifted from the driver's side, she let out a small squeal. He's gone, she thought. We've been past him for a long time now. He probably went after that truck driver anyway. It was a guilty thought, but she shook it off. She was glad to be spared if he had to go after someone. Metal scraped on metal, the sound of her dad taking the pop tire off the car. It wouldn't be like changing a bike tire, it would be slower. She shook that thought off too. It wouldn't be. Yes, a car was bigger and more complicated than the Rayleigh she had at home, but it didn't have a chain to fuss with. Dad would have it fixed in no time. Tracy twisted in her seat as her dad got to his feet. Robbie took the spare out of the trunk and rolled it along the road. She twisted back to watch Dad as he put his hands on his lower back and stretched his belly out. The tiny pops in his spine could be heard even through the rolled up windows. Got it? He asked Robbie. Before receiving an answer, the shadow tore through Dad's body and sent it tumbling into the middle of the road. Tracy screamed and fumbled at her seatbelt as the shadow continued off in the direction they were heading. Robbie shouted for Dad and ran into the road. Tracy bounded out her door and after him. Dad! Robbie repeated as he fell to his knees at their father's body. Dad was sprawled on his back. Arms and legs struck out like a starfish. His face and skin were rubbed raw from the road. When he tried to talk, blood wept from the corners of his mouth. He stared up at the stars, blinking with confusion. Oh, fuck? He said, before coughing. Dark flecks of blood flew out and speckled Robbie's face. We need to get back in the car, Robbie. Tracy tugged his sleeve, trying to pull him away from their father. But he was too heavy. It's, it's going to come back. What was it? A motorcycle? Where were its fucking lights? He was hysterical. It's not Robbie. It's a monster, please. She was crying. Runners of snot ran down her face. She didn't care. They needed to go. They needed to get back to the car. I need to get Dad out of the road. It's not safe here. He was crying too. But he wiped at his eyes and his arm grabbed their dad by the hand. When he pulled, a large gash opened along his torso. Tracy and her brother were treated to the sight of his organs desperately trying to keep him alive. Twitching hoses covered in yellow and red. Ribs so white where they weren't covered in blood. Two big purple balloons shuddered as they failed to fill. Robbie let go of the arm. He sat down hard and began to sob between his knees. Please! Tracy screamed. Her head hurt like it was full of gravel, grinding and pushing on her skull. She looked in the direction the shadow had run off in and saw it far away, where the road climbed to a hill. It stood at the top. His legs had stopped pinwheeling. They were splayed wide. He was silhouetted in the moonlight. He was way too long. He seemed to stretch even longer before her eyes. One arm lifted high into the air and began to wave like a childhood friend greeting another from across the street. They were jerky movements, full of clumsy energy. His body tilted forward. His legs moved, slow at first, but increasing to that same blur she had seen from the car. It's coming back, Robbie, she said. We need to get off the road. No. Her brother had seen the shadow with its mocking wave. Robbie wiped at his nose and rose shakily to his feet. That asshole killed our dad! He killed our dad! Tracy looked at the man who had carried her on his shoulders for every parade and saw that he was no longer breathing. He looked up at the sky, as if waiting for a hand of God to reach down and pull him up to heaven. It was too much. 
she fell to her knees and wailed as her brother staggered in front of her dad in a protective stance. Get in the car, Trace. She looked up, but couldn't find the strength to stand. Robbie, she whispered. The shadow sprinted toward them with inhuman speed. A whine on the wind, high and full of tension. It sounded like a dog being held back from a big, meaty bone. There was no leash on the shadow, though, and it came. It squealed like an overtaxed engine. The noise tore apart the night. Robbie roared, his jaw dropping and his clenched fist shaking at his sides. It was primal and full of strength Tracy had never seen in him. Over the sounds the two made, an enormous horn blared. It sounded like a foghorn, but they weren't near any oceans. A truck, Tracy thought and stood. Robbie, she shouted, but the truck's loud warning drowned out her little voice. Fortunately, the lights from the cab washed over him, and he understood what was happening. He juked towards the car and sprinted away from their dad's body. Robbie wasn't as fast as the shadow following them from God knows where, but he was fast enough. He cleared the path of the truck. Tracy heard the squeal of its brakes. The wheels locked up, but the weight of the semi pushed it forward. It flattened the shadow as it turned towards her and her brother. As the last wheel rolled over the figure, it caught it and dragged the shadow along the road. Steam rose from the slushy road. The engine of the truck ticked. They stood by the car and looked at their dad in the truck's brake lights. The red of the lights washed over the blood, making it look lighter. The red of candy apple... The man who had waved at Tracy from the truck's cab opened the door and almost fell out. He was small, frantic, almost vibrating. His head was as bald as the creature, though shinier. He tipped as he rushed forward to the body of their dad. Oh, God, he said over and over. He thought he hit dad. He hit something, Tracy thought as the truck driver called 911. In his haste to get help, he had forgotten that there were two kids in the car with Dad. Tracy didn't mind. She didn't want to deal with him just then. The flashlight was in the back seat where she dropped it. Tracy grabbed it, then walked toward the back of the semi-truck. Where are you going? Robbie asked, scrambling after her. It needs to be dead. She flicked the light on and aimed it in front of her. They both examined what was pinned to the ground. The figure stared up at Tracy from beneath the tire. It was rubbed raw with bits of black, smoldering pieces ripped off and strewn along the road. It knew what it had done. It knew she would spend the next month, year, crying over the loss of her father she would no longer be able to go to him with her many curiosities about the world, would receive no comfort for her hurts and hear no corny dad jokes. The shadow showed tremendous joy at tearing apart her father. From under the big wheel, his smile stretched even wider. It reached grotesquely around the back of its round head until the creaking came from within its throat. What's it doing? Robbie asked, sounding like a small child instead of a teenager on the brink of manhood. It's laughing. The beam of her flashlight flickered. It was an emergency light, recharged by turning the crank on the side. Tracy didn't have the energy to do it. The shadow's arms stretched out towards her. It opened and closed its long fingers like a child trying to grasp something it felt it deserved. Tracy took a step back, repulsed by the creature. It oozed dark, 
wet liquid from where the ash felt wore away bits of its flesh. It looked like oil, like some natural slime a snake would secrete. Are snakes slimy? She didn't know. She couldn't ask her dad. Robbie, are her snakes slimy? When she looked to him for an answer, he was gone. Robbie? She spun in a circle, searching for him. Robbie was on the other side of a smashed concrete divider. He held a large, heavy stone slab when he came back over it. He hefted it high as he approached the thing trapped under the semi-truck's wheel. The flashlight went dark. The creature kept laughing. The light revealed shadows. It did not destroy them. Somewhere in the forest, bears prepared for the upcoming winter. I hope you enjoyed Speed of Shadow, as written by Christopher O'Halloran and performed by Alicia Pavlis and Eric Peabody. You can hear more of Eric Peabody's work by tuning in on Thursday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern, where he hosts the show Horror Hill. Horror Hill is a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. On that note, be sure to check out the other shows we offer on our network. We have Scary Stories Told in the Dark by Otis Jiry, airing Sundays. Fear from the Heartland, featuring horror stories brought to you from the Heartland, airing Wednesdays. Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. Also, folks, the scriptwriter made an error in last week's script. Kill the Curdler was actually voiced by Justin Reynolds and Melissa Medina. If you haven't heard it yet, go on back to last week and have a listen. You won't be disappointed. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.
Tales for Dark Nights.